Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party and top man in the Kremlin hierarchy. For more than 10 years, he's been one of the most powerful men in the world. But in recent weeks, there have been rumors that his political influence and his health are both in decline. Soviet authorities strongly deny there's anything amiss, but Brezhnev's scarcely been seen in public since these scenes of his departure from Paris were filmed two months ago. Whatever the truth of the current rumors, it's worth taking a look back at some of the major events of the Brezhnev decade. The immediate roots of Brezhnev's power lie in the rolling fields of Kazakhstan. It was here that his political mentor, Nikita Khrushchev, centered his Virgin Lands reclamation project during the 1950s. Brezhnev was sent to mastermind the project, turning millions of unused acres into productive farmland. It had seemed at first almost like a banishment, but the scheme got off to a good start and Brezhnev's career prospered. When Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin arrived back on Earth in triumph in 1961, he was greeted first by Premier Khrushchev and then by Leonid Brezhnev, president of the Presidium and official head of state. Brezhnev was president for four years, and during that time, he was able to broaden his horizons with several trips abroad, notably to Africa and India. It was whilst he was in India, in December 1961, that Indian forces reclaimed the territory of Goa from the Portuguese. Brezhnev assured his hosts of his complete sympathy with their bid to end colonial domination. Brezhnev's drive turned the figurehead presidency into a position of real authority. In April 1964, he was conferring birthday honors on his longtime protector. By October of the same year, he had replaced him as head of the party and thus of the nation. At first, he shared power with President Podgorny and Premier Kosygin, but by the time of the 23rd Party Congress in 1966, he was well on the way to establishing himself as first among equals. Brezhnev had the reputation of a conservative and in 1968 he proved it. In Czechoslovakia, Alexander Dubček tried to create what he called socialism with a human face. Brezhnev and his colleagues saw it differently and on the night of August 20th, they sent Soviet tanks and other Warsaw Pact forces into Czechoslovakia. The Russians claimed they were saving Czechoslovakia and issued newsreels showing Russian soldiers chatting with the grateful population. Other cameras saw a different truth. Czech blood had been spilled and there was no doubt that many Czechs were enraged at the invasion. The balance of world opinion came down heavily against the Russians, but Brezhnev defended the action in the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine, which claimed national sovereignty was less important than the preservation of socialism. Repercussions of the Czech affair were still being felt the following year, when Brezhnev played host to the World Communist Conference in Moscow. Once again, he defended the invasion, claiming its target had been those who'd sought to restore capitalism in Czechoslovakia. He also made a scathing attack on communist China, which had boycotted the conference. The Sino-Soviet split was something Brezhnev had inherited from the Khrushchev era, and it was beyond his power to put a speedy end to it. Only weeks before the conference, Soviet and Chinese border troops had clashed along the Asuri River. Several were killed, and in Peking, the People's Daily abused Brezhnev and his colleagues as a herd of swine. 
Brezhnev's pressing need to mend his fences with the Chinese became all the more apparent when Richard Nixon showed that even America was no longer willing to remain at odds with the world's most populous nation, whatever the ideological differences between them. Nixon's visit to Peking in February 1972 was a challenge which the Kremlin has yet to meet. From his early days in power, Brezhnev made it clear that he was interested in superpower detente, not confrontation. But he made sure that he was able to argue from a position of strength, and under his leadership, the Soviet Union amassed a nuclear arsenal capable of annihilating any potential aggressor, including the United States. Every year, the rockets increased in power and in numbers. But disarmament talks continued at various levels, and in May 1972, President Nixon made another historic visit, this time to Moscow, which ended in the signing of a treaty to limit both anti-ballistic missiles and offensive strategic nuclear arms. The two nations also agreed to cooperate on many other matters, including trade, medical research, the environment and outer space. It was a major diplomatic advance and a personal triumph for both leaders. <laughs> Meanwhile, Brezhnev had begun to travel more widely himself. In 1971, he went to Paris, his first trip to a non-communist country since assuming office. It was an important trip in which a great deal depended on Brezhnev's personality. For the average Frenchman's fear of the Stalinist image of communism has long been one of the main stumbling blocks of the French Communist Party, which is one of the largest in the non-communist world. In the event, the General Secretary's gruff charm did little to allay the bitter memories of Czechoslovakia. An important trade treaty was signed, but the French communists have continued to lose elections, and for the same reasons as before. In May 1973, as if to show that the Cold War had really ended, Brezhnev embarked on the first ever trip of a Soviet leader to Western Germany. He was greeted by demonstrations protesting against the treatment of Christians and Jews in Russia. The visit set the seal on the years of painstaking work by West German Chancellor Willy Brandt, whose Ostpolitik, or policy of friendly relations with the Eastern Bloc, depended heavily on Brezhnev's cooperation. Brezhnev, incidentally, has the reputation of being a hearty drinker who rarely refuses a glass, and on this occasion, he seemed very anxious to point out he was only sipping tomato juice. The dialogue with President Nixon was continued the following month when Brezhnev went to the United States. There were more negotiations on arms limitation, resulting in fresh agreements, but for most of the trip, the Soviet leader was in boisterous mood, and at an open-air press conference in San Clemente, he seemed less concerned about the translation of his speech than in getting everyone into the picture. ...line conduct, and who have thus, and who in thus doing so are helping us in our work. <laughs> 
And I therefore trust that the peaceful policies pursued by the President and by the United States government under him will be supported by the people. Mixing serious talk of peace with humor and friendliness, Brezhnev created just the right impression. No mean task in front of an audience basically opposed to everything he stood for. Goodbye. 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 Little more than a year later, the two leaders met once again, this time on Russian soil. After talks in Moscow, they flew to Brezhnev's villa near Yalta on the Black Sea. By this time, the revelations and accusations of the Watergate affair had well and truly broken over Nixon. And the way Brezhnev completely ignored the scandal eventually brought criticism from inside the Soviet Union. It was claimed his support for the American president had made the Soviet authorities appear naive. In the Middle East, Soviet policy during the Brezhnev years has met with mixed success. Soviet influence in the area undoubtedly increased, but in 1967, Israel's smashing of the Arab armies brought no credit to the Russians, who had backed and armed the Arabs. The picture was only a little better in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. In the last couple of years, Soviet reluctance to rearm Egypt has led to a widening rift between Cairo and Moscow. American influence, on the contrary, has greatly increased, thanks to the energetic diplomacy of Secretary of State Kissinger. In a recent newspaper interview, President Sadat openly accused the Kremlin of unfriendly motives towards Egypt, while he'd nothing but praise for Dr. Kissinger. Brezhnev was, in fact, due to visit Egypt last month, but the trip was called off, apparently because of his failing health. On the domestic front, the Brezhnev years have seen steady, if not spectacular, progress. Living conditions have improved, although housing's still a problem, especially for families. Russians are now able to buy many of the goods they want, although in general there's still far less variety than in Western nations. Like Khrushchev before him, Brezhnev set himself to fulfilling Soviet demand for consumer goods, and he imported vast amounts of Western technology in order to boost relatively unsophisticated local industries. In other domestic spheres, Brezhnev has shown himself to be deeply conservative. Under Khrushchev, the Soviet citizens' right to political and cultural freedom had advanced a little, even though in fits and starts. But under Brezhnev, it came to an abrupt halt. Prominent Soviet writers, such as Sinyavsky and Daniel, were imprisoned for their views. And last year, one of the country's greatest novelists, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, was banished and stripped of his Soviet citizenship for publishing in Paris a work critical of the regime. Himself a veteran of Stalin's labor camps, Solzhenitsyn fled to Western Germany before eventually settling in Switzerland, where his wife and family were eventually allowed to join him. He's recently accused the Soviet leadership of cracking down even further on dissidents, and he claims that external detente has been accompanied by suppression at home. Solzhenitsyn wasn't the Soviet Union's only cultural émigré last year. In June, former Bolshoi dancers Valery and Galina Panov landed in Tel Aviv after a two-year struggle to be allowed to emigrate to Israel.
It was good news for the Panovs, but bad publicity for the Soviet authorities, who consistently found the Jewish emigration issue a difficult one to handle. It was, for example, at the center of Moscow's repudiation last month of the trade agreement with America. The cancelling of the trade agreement, together with the rumours over Brezhnev's future, have led to fears about how well East-West detente will survive the special relationship built up by Nixon and Brezhnev. Last November, Nixon's successor, President Ford, met Brezhnev in Vladivostok for talks on further limitations on strategic nuclear arms. The atmosphere was cordial, and the two leaders reached agreement in principle on measures that would control such weapons for the next decade. There seemed every prospect of Soviet-American relations continuing to prosper. But since then, anti-American references have increased in the Soviet press, and the cancellation of the trade bill is seen as an indication that a harder line may now be developing among the Soviet leadership. Set against the background of the history of Soviet communism, Brezhnev emerges as one of the new breed of Soviet leaders, the technocrats and party stalwarts who make up in education and efficiency whatever they may lack in revolutionary fire. It's surely not without significance that he's the first Soviet leader who did not fight in the Bolshevik revolution.